Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, sharing. Thank you, uh, Bill and Sherry, for uh, putting this event on. Uh, first time in Colorado, and beautiful out here. So, I'm excited to be out here. Um, so I'm up here uh, to talk to you. Uh, obviously, we said uh, I am in recovery. Uh, celebrating five years uh, sober. Uh, coming up here on Thanksgiving. So. So one of the things uh, when I got sober was uh, <clears throat> moved into a transitional house and I was kind of like, okay, you know, this is, there's, there's a lot of great resources and I've been blessed in the fact that like I had great family support and people around me and people to, to assist me. But when I'm in, uh, when I was in the transitional house, I'm around a bunch of guys and their girlfriends and things like that that are struggling this process and they were like, hey John, can you help us with anything? I try to help my uninsured uh, girlfriend who's struggling with the opiate addiction and getting this treatment. So I made some phone calls, I called around, and I was trying to you know, loop into some resources that might be available to them, some of these state-funded programs that would have you know, been designated to treat this individual. And I called, and at that time, I basically got three responses by the professionals in the field when I called up to those places. And that was basically that um, um, there was a six-month waiting list uh, to get into the, the treatment program. You know, six months to get in, uh, or six months to get on the list of the waitings. And I was like, okay. Like, so what are we supposed to do in the meantime with this person? And they were like, well, uh, they have two other options, and that is one, um, we can, uh, if she attempts suicide, and you sign an affidavit that she is suicidal and attempted suicide, she can get into a hospital for a 96 to 72 hour hold, um, but they will just basically hold her and discharge her back into the community. I was like, well, that doesn't sound very sustainable either. I was like, what is this third option? Better be good, right? And it was, uh, well, if you tell her to commit a crime bad enough, um, she could be incarcerated, and then the state will then prioritize her as um, a high risk person to society, and she will get treatment after her incarceration. So, so really, like throughout this process, uh, you know, this is kind of where the vision of Archway really got started because uh, through that, you know, we made a couple phone calls, talked to a couple people, and found out that you know, a three hundred to five hundred dollar scholarship, you know, to help this person was the difference between them getting into services and receiving all these benefits of all the resources that are available to them or not. So, just to get them in the door, just to get them into the, the realm. Um, and so, you know, we, we really believe in the recovery of addiction, but that's, you know, we believe in that and with the right resources, the right environment, uh, that people can and do get better. Um, so, barriers to recovery. I'm just going to pull all these up because I'm impatient. Um, <laughs> So asking for help, right? So here, here we are. We got one in 10 people in the US uh, have an addiction, disease, or disorder, right? Uh, one in three families are dealing with a loved one that is struggling with the disease. Um, out of those people, uh, less than 20% seek out treatment. Um, and stigma is the number one reason people do not ask for help. Now, let me just kind of like elaborate on that a little bit. You know, it's uh, you know, so when somebody is struggling with substance abuse, right, you know, obviously, you know, substance abuse is a symptom of underlying issues, right? They use substances to cope, deal, understand, work through their problems. This is their coping mechanism, right? So this is, this is not the disease, it is the symptom of the disease that they're struggling with. Uh, so they use this to cope, you know, but the symptoms of substance abuse are incarceration, you know, loss of jobs, loss of financial backing, loved ones, poor relationships. So when I'm struggling, when I relapse, when I'm going through this, my behavioral patterns tell me that I will lose my job, I will be incarcerated, I will be put on the streets, I will be homeless, I will be, you know, I'll lose all my friends, family, and all these things. So what would I do with that? If, the, if you knew that was the consequences of a relapse, if you were struggling, what would you do? You would hold it in. I'm not telling anybody. I'm gonna deal with this, be a man, you know what I mean? Like, deal with this problem yourself, you know, try to fight this out, and then what ends up happening? It progresses. I mean, we're dealing with progressive disease, we're dealing with highly addictive substances, we're dealing with people that are really struggling with mental health.
Arduan.